Our New Testament theology class is eight weeks, as are all of our classes. Today we're doing the introduction. Next week we are going to talk about Christology and Incarnation. I'm going to talk about these words later and why we've structured this the way that it's structured. So we're going to come back to this. Christology is the study of how it is that Jesus was the Christ, the Anointed One, the Son of God. The Incarnation is the physical part. Some people would call that Jesusology. Okay, that's a real word, Jesusology. We don't hear it as often. The next week, the third week, we are going to kind of double back and deal with the issue of the Trinity. That is the Christology. Because we're talking about the New Testament, and the New Testament starts with the Gospels, the story of Jesus incarnate, his earthly ministry. We start with Christology and the Incarnation, then we go to Trinity, which is, we bring in then the New Testament uh, aspects of the doctrines of the Father and of the Holy Spirit. The fourth week, we're going to deal with ecclesiology, which is the theological word for the, the, the doctrine of the church. What is the church? The fifth week, we are going to deal with Christian anthropology. Anthropology is the study of uh, humanity. Anthros, anthropos, actually, man, humanity. Um, and so Christian anthropology is what it means to be a human in the presence of a God who has revealed himself in Jesus Christ. The sixth week, we're going to talk about soteriology, actually hamartiology and soteriology. You're going to love these words. Hamartiology, which is not up here, um, is the doctrine of sin. Soteriology, based on the Greek word soter, means to, uh, to be saved or savior. Soteriology is the doctrine of salvation. So week six, we will talk about hamartiology, the doctrine of sin, and soteriology, the doctrine of salvation. And remember, my job is to make this understandable to you as best I can, even though, you know, hopefully it won't go over your heads. Uh, and then the seventh week, eschatology. Eschatology is the study of last things. It is uh, the end of time and how God is going to wrap all of this up, um, particularly based upon Revelation. And then week eight, we're going to do a conclusion, filling in the blanks, and then the, for the first hour, and then the last hour will be the final exam. Final exam is pass-fail, and as we go through the course, I will give you a document which, which is called What You Need to Know About New Testament Theology. And the test that we give you, everything on the test will be on that paper. That both allows you to know what you need to study in order to have a good, under, broad understanding of this, and it also means you don't have to worry about what's on the test. For those of you who took classes last term, were you satisfied that I told you everything you needed to know? Do I get an amen? Amen. amen. Okay. So don't worry about the test if you haven't taken them before. It's actually useful to take the test and to study for the test because that's where it all sorts of comes together in terms of concentrating the data, the facts, the information that you really need to know. Okay. So this is the layout for the class. I reserve the right as we go along to make changes. Uh, I always have to say that. But let me say, here is what you can and should expect from this class, New Testament Theology. As opposed, I had a different version of this for New Testament Survey, and I'll have something else on Friday for the Spiritual Disciplines of the Christian Faith. In this class, by the end of this class, assuming you attend the lectures and you read the materials, you should have a good sense of the major theological themes, and the next thing I'm going to do here is talk about what theology means and theological. Theological themes that are contained in the New Testament, along with an evangelical understanding of how we believe God has revealed himself through these writings and doctrines. Evangelical, with a capital E here, means a, to have both a conservative view of the nature of Jesus Christ in Scripture, that this is the inspired word of God to us, but also that Jesus Christ was the, the Son of God, co-eternal with the Father, who came to earth in a physical incarnation, died, literally died, was physically resurrected, ascended, and is coming again to rule forever as the Lord. Okay? That, I could get more technical and more historical in de defining evangelical, but that's what it really means to us. So I'm specific in saying an evangelical understanding as opposed to a liberal understanding or some other aspect of it. And at some point, um, when we get into our church history classes, which we'll have church history one next term, um, probably church history two, we will get more into understanding what evangelicalism is from a historical point of view. Uh, evangelicalism and fundamentalism, which is a word you know, are similar in terms of their theological beliefs, but they have a different um, expression historically. We'll talk about that. Okay, any questions about what to expect from this class? This is important stuff.
talk about why it's important today. First, I want to share with you uh, a Peanuts cartoon. Are you all familiar with The Gospel According to Peanuts, the wonderful book? Yes. This is from that book. Um, so Lucy and her brother Linus are sitting in the window looking out at the rain, and Lucy says, boy, look at it rain. What if it floods the whole world? And Linus says, it will never do that. In the ninth chapter of Genesis, God promised Noah that would never happen again, and the sign of the promise is the rainbow. Lucy says, you've taken a great load off my mind. And Linus says, sound theology has a way of doing that. <laughs> One of the reasons that we're here studying theology, the theology of the New Testament, is because it, sound theology, good theology, is the foundation for which we understand ourselves and God, the rest of creation God has, has uh, made for us, and how all of that fits together, particularly God and us and how we are to relate to God. That's what theology really is all about. And sound theology has a way of putting our minds to rest, so we appreciate that. Okay, before I get into a definition of what theology means, let me talk about what the New Testament is. And I gave this definition again in the first uh, class on Saturday, or on, Saturday, on Monday, but we need to have the same understanding. The New Testament. The New Testament is the story of the earthly life and ministry of Jesus Christ, which is given in the four Gospels, of the birth and growth of the early church in the book of Acts, and the development and articulation of the Christian faith and theology, which is found in the epistles, and in the book of Revelation. Epistles are the letters. And this is, that's the sort of concept statement, the top one, of what the New Testament is. In very practical terms, the bottom is, the New Testament is made up of 27 books that are all written in Koine, or common Greek. Back in the first century, they had formal Greek, which was used in, in academia, in scholarship. But then they had the everyday language of Koine, or common Greek. Interesting little story. Uh, I didn't mention this on Monday, but um, Koine Greek, the common Greek, the only examples they had of it for many, many, many years was the New Testament. They had no other examples that it was used anywhere else. And so early scholars used to call it Holy Spirit Greek because they thought it might have been a special version of Greek that the Holy Spirit had created just so the writers of the New Testament could write the New Testament. Later on, they began to find other kinds of business records and sort of everyday documents that were not part of the church or the scripture, and they realized that this is just common Greek for the day. Another thing that tells us is that they are still, um, archaeology and the, the study of ancient manuscripts and things, they are still finding stuff. They are still coming across new discoveries. This is being added to all the time. And there have never been discoveries which in any significant way of all, at all have challenged what our basic theological understanding is based upon the New Testament. We talked about that last term in Old Testament theology, in Old Testament survey, with regard to the Dead Sea Scrolls. Liberal theologians had always said, oh, well, the scripture that we have, you know, it's been changed so many times, you, you can't be sure that's what it originally said, and blah, blah, blah. Then they found the Dead Sea Scrolls, which were much older than any other Old Testament document documents we had extant, and they discovered that they hadn't been changed, that they hadn't, and not in any significant way. They were small scribble errors, but nothing that changed any point of theology or belief of any significance. Well, the same thing is true of the New Testament. The New Testament, as we'll talk about later in the survey class, is the most completely attested ancient document by, by a hundredfold of anything else that we have from ancient times. Okay? <coughs> so, 27 books written in Koine or Common Greek, written between the years of about 49, it's 40-ish, 49 to 100 AD by nine different authors. They were Matthew, Mark, Luke, wrote two books, Luke, the Gospel of Luke and Acts. John wrote five books, Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and the Book of Revelation. Paul, the Apostle Paul, wrote 13 epistles from, uh, from Romans to Jude, uh, to uh, Philemon. The book of James, uh, Peter wrote 1st and 2nd Peter. Jude wrote the little one chapter book Jude, which is right toward the end. And then the, uh, the anonymous author of Hebrews. We don't know who that was. So nine different authors. Now, one of the challenges that we have recognizing that there are 27 books, nine different authors, do we have a theology of the New Testament, meaning one theology of the New Testament, or do we have nine theologies of the New Testament because there are nine different writers? Or do we have 27 because there's 27 different books? 
That's one of the challenges that we have anytime we do theology. In the Old Testament, it was even a more compounded question because there were more authors, more books over a longer period of time. But our belief, and I believe this is, this is supported when we actually study the text of Scripture, is that God, God the Holy Spirit inspired all of those writers toward the same end. They may reflect different aspects of it. For instance, Paul in uh, Ephesians and Galatians and other places emphasizes grace and our salvation by grace, not by works. Well, there was a danger that that would go, you know, that would be taken too far in terms of not feeling like that we had libertines, they were called, people back in Paul's time who would say, great, I'm saved by grace, I can do anything I want, I can go out and party hardy, and tomorrow just say, well, Lord, I'm sorry, and I'm fine. Well, but you have the book of James, which on the surface may sound like it's saying the opposite, because James said faith without works is dead, that you, how you live does make a difference. Well, the reason is because Paul was addressing the problem of libertines, or the problem of legalists, I'm sorry, people who thought you had to follow the law, whereas James was addressing the problem of libertines, people who thought, hey, I'm saved by grace, I can do whatever I want as long as I you know, still believe in Jesus. So they're not contradictory. They have to, they balance because they reflect different aspects. It's not different theologies, it's all part of one theology. But when you start pursuing theology of the New Testament, or even of the Old Testament, you do have to be aware of the fact that if we believe, as we do, that this is one theology that God has given to us through nine different authors in the New Testament and 27 different books, we need to see the unity of that and understand how each of the pieces fit into it. And that's part of the challenge of studying New Testament theology. Okay, fair? You do know that as we go along, if you've got any questions, you can, you know, Yell at me, raise your hand, throw a shoe, whatever you have to, as I said before, to get my attention. So, but we will, we will work with the concept that there is one New Testament theology, which is, God has, in his wisdom, manifested through different particular emphases with different authors in different books. That's why it's 27 books and nine authors, not one author in one book. Okay? Um, and somebody once said, for instance, and we'll talk about this next week a little bit, people have said, why do you have four Gospels? And they're not exactly the same in terms of they don't contradict each other, but Matthew sort of sees one side of it, and you know uh, Mark and he sees another side, and Luke another side. Well, an attorney once said, you know, if if a judge called forth four different witnesses to an event, and they all said exactly the same thing in exactly the same words, he'd throw the case out because he'd think there's obviously collusion. This doesn't this does not ring true. The very fact that our New Testament has four different books to tell the story of Jesus from four different perspectives that are not contradictory, but they give different aspects of it from the point of view of any legal consideration, that would be more convincing, not less. Okay, does that make sense? Um, so we'll get into that a little bit next week when we start talking about the Synoptic Gospels in the Monday class when we talk about the Christology and Incarnation in here. All right? So, what is theology? I'm going to give you several definitions here to get us started. The first one is a definition of theology proper. Theology is the study of God, pretty much period. It is based upon two Greek words, theos, which is God, and ology, which mean, or logos, I'm sorry, which means study. Now, that same combination of things, theo, God, and ology, or from the logos, study, we have other words like biology. Bios is Greek for life. Logos is for study. Biology is the study of life. Uh, geology, the word for earth in Greek is G. The, the logos, ology, is the study. So the study of the earth is geology. Psychology, psyche is the mind. The logos is the study. Psychology is the study of the mind, and on and on. So theology is the proper study of God. In particular, Christian theology is the study and effort to understand God as he has revealed himself in Scripture. You're going to hear me hitting that point over and over and over again because a fundamental principle of evangelical Christian theology is that everything we know about God, everything that we find in the New Testament, is, re is a self-revelation of God speaking through the nine authors of the New Testament. So we believe that the New Testament, as in the Old Testament, is God's own revelation to us. 
that he has given so that we can know him better. Francis Schaeffer was one of my real heroes uh, when I first became a Christian. He and C.S. Lewis were very significant to me. One of Schaeffer's books is entitled, He is There and He is Not Silent. Our God is not a God who is silent. You remember the story in the Old Testament where Elijah is, is competing or is uh, challenging the prophets of Baal. And the prophets of Baal start out, and they're dancing and singing and beating on drums and clanging cymbals, and they're cutting themselves and screaming all day long. And Elijah's over on the side teasing them, saying, Is your God asleep? Has he gone away? Can you not wake him? Is he not paying attention? Why, why do you have to do all this to get a hold of your God? Our God has not been silent. He has not departed. He is not asleep. He is not, not paying attention. He is there and he is not silent. We believe that God has chosen to reveal himself, particularly in his written word. It is there that we find the great truths of his incarnate son and of all the other things that are fundamental to our understanding of God, of us, and of how we and God are supposed to fit together. Okay? Questions about that? All right, let's, let's expand on that a little bit. Biblical theology. More specifically, the study of biblical theology is the study of doctrines found in the Bible arranged according to their chronology and historical background. Biblical theology looks at the Bible and sort of takes theological understanding out of it, but keeps it in the same general order that the Bible presents it, perhaps in a chronological order, because the Bible is not written chronologically. The first of Paul's letters that he wrote was not Romans, it was Galatians, which comes later. As we said on Monday, the books of the New Testament um, and the Old Testament prophets, for instance, have been arranged a long, long time ago based upon size. Romans is the longest of Paul's books, so it comes first, not because it was written first. So, but biblical theology is to either look at the chronology or the historical background and keep that as a primary matrix in which we express the theology. For instance, we can talk about the theology of the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament or a theology of the writings of John in the New Testament, or the writing, we could do a biblical theology study of Paul's theology of grace to the church in Ephesus, for instance. But there's always a sense in which you, you defer to and refer back to the presence of those theology in a, in a particular time uh, in which it was written in Bible, the Bible or a particular location in the Bible. Got that? So the Bible reference always stays in there with biblical theology. As opposed to that, or not opposed to it, but a different approach to that, is systematic theology. Systematic theology is the division and articulation of theological doctrines by systematic categories or groupings in order to better understand their final meaning and their relevance for today. For instance, a theology of angels. Now, angels are referred to all through the Old Testament and all through the New Testament. If you want to have one sort of collected understanding of angels, then that's a systematic theology challenge, not a biblical theology challenge. If you wanted to talk about angels in the book of Isaiah, that would be more biblical theology. You see, my, you see the difference. Now, it's a difference in terms of... Um, there's a historical reasons why there's a particular difference between those. They are different disciplines today. Uh, and I'll talk about... Johann Gabler in a few minutes, and, and uh, those of you who are in Old Testament may remember that name, because he's the one that really made a difference between those, in a very useful way. There's a useful reason why we differentiate between those two. And then we have dogmatic theology. Dogmatic theology is a form of systematic theology. It takes the same kind of approach, but it is used to articulate and defend the theological doctrines of a particular organized church body. There is, for instance, the dogma or dogmatic theology of the Roman Catholic Church, as opposed to the dogmatic theology of the Presbyterians or of dispensationalist theology. In other words, dogmatic means some body or group of the church has kind of commissioned this theology in order to explain or defend or represent their particular beliefs. And it always has implied in dogmatic theology that there's some official stamp of approval. Okay, by that church body. So it is a very specific kind of systematic theology. Now, I'm going to explain to you in short order today why these things are different and why it's important that we keep those distinctions. Because at various times in, our, in the history of the development of theology, New Testament theology, when those things have been confused, it's gotten us down the wrong trail. And we'll talk about that. Okay? Now, 
Howard, uh, I. Howard Marshall, one of the great New Testament theologians today, has said, has sort of summed it up by saying, the task of theology, that is all theology, is to state what Christians believe in a systematic and orderly fashion. I should say uh, Christian theology because there actually is Hindu theology and Muslim theology and Buddhist theology, etc. But the task of Christian theology is to state what Christians believe in a systematic and orderly fashion. That's why we have theology. If somebody asks you, well, what do you believe about sin? Well, you can perhaps remember one or two scripture verses, but if you have studied it in a sense, uh, a, either a biblical or a systematic theological sense, you have a much greater ability to explain what is it we believe about the nature of sin and what we do about it than just being able to pop off a verse that you might remember unless you have made the task of memorizing every possible verse about sin. Okay? So that's why we do theology, so that we can articulate what we believe as Christians in a systematic and orderly fashion. And again, I'm going to talk about why that is important as we go along here. Questions about any of that? Oh, the things you now know. <laughs> to misquote Al Franken. Um, okay. What is New Testament theology specifically? The definition for you to, um, to take in and absorb and love is New Testament theology is the art and science of knowing and understanding what we can about God in an organized and understandable way through what he has revealed in the New Testament. Again, um, it's an organized and understandable way. It is about God and especially what he has revealed to us. Theology legitimately done is not something that you can go out and independent from any sense of God, figure out for yourself. All right? Now, I want to talk about that for a few minutes. Since our theology is what is revealed to us by God, we need to admit right up front that no theology will ever fully explain God. Because the nature of God is that he is infinitely and eternally higher than and different than us. Scripture talks about the fact, my ways are not your ways, my thoughts not your thoughts, God said. That's the, that's the doctrine of transcendence, which we talked about in Old Testament, because it comes out in Old Testament even stronger. So, no theology can ever fully explain God, and yet God does want us to know Him as far as we are capable of such knowing. And to that end, He has revealed Himself so that we can know Him, so that we can come into relationship with Him. That's critical to New Testament theology, is that God has revealed himself for a purpose, so that we can know him to the extent it's possible, and we can come into relationship with him. Now, New Testament theology then means that we, we discipline ourselves to dig into God's word in a systematic and organized way in order to discover those things that God has revealed to us about himself. He revealed, but we have to do the work of learning, of seeking the things he has revealed to us. God has gone through so much to provide this knowledge to us in his word, and if the best we can do, like so many of my southern relatives, is to have a great big family Bible that sits on your coffee table and collects <coughs> dust and nobody ever looks at it, then God's effort to reveal himself is not going to do anything for you. So we have to go in. The task of New Testament theology is to go into the New Testament and find what God has told us. The idea being that in doing that, we come to know more about God. As we know more about God, we can come to love Him more, and then increase in our desire to obey Him and His instructions to us. Another theologian has said, as Christians, we should be consumed with theology. You're all interested, at least, or you wouldn't be here. Now you need to get to the point of being consumed. We should be consumed by theology. That is the intense personal study of God in order to love and obey the one with whom we will joyfully spend eternity. This should be, and I know this is a bold thing to say because you've all got lots of priorities in your life, the study of the things of God should be the number one focus of your life on this earth. We are here to serve God personally, to serve God through serving others, and to prepare ourselves for the eternity with Him. This is, a, this is a growing up place for us. And the way we do it is by growing closer to God, by learning more of Him. That's the job of theology. 
whether you've ever thought about it or not. Okay? Now, particularly the reason why we focus on theological understanding is to base our own assurance on it of what we can know and come to know about God and grow in that. But we have to recognize that part of our job here as Christians is also to minister to other people. And we have to be ready for that. We have to be prepared to deal with people who don't come from the same perspective that we are. And I want to give you four particular um, isms that are pretty much cover the spectrum of the non-Christian beliefs that are out there today. Now, if you've taken our new members class, I actually look at all the different ways that people have believed in God, you know, whether it's, it's uh, atheism, agnosticism, um, the monotheism, polytheism, pantheism, panentheism, and I have one I call lazyism. <laughs> lazyism is, I don't know, I don't care, where's my beer? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm to get to something like that, but there are four particular um, aspects of the way the world thinks that's not Christian that we have to be prepared to speak to if we're going to be effective in ministering the knowledge of God to those who don't yet know him. The first one is agnosticism. And that's people who, who will say, I honestly don't know. Don't know if there's a God or if there's not. I don't know about Jesus. I don't know. And the, implied in that is, someday I may discover there are answers. I'm sort of open to it, but right now I don't know. That's agnosticism. Agnosticism literally means without knowing. Okay. So an agnostic says, I honestly don't know. We have to be, through our own study and our training and our prayer life, our own spiritual life, but through study particularly here, we have to be prepared to address the needs of a person who's agnostic. Secondly, we have people who are skeptics. A skeptic says, I really don't think so. And implied in that is the idea that I'm not sure there are or that there ever will be any answers. In fact, I doubt it. The difference in an agnostic is they're kind of open. I don't know, but I'm open to that. A skeptic is saying, not likely. You know, I don't think so. The third level in our society, in our world, uh, is pessimism. The pessimist says, I'm afraid not. Now, historically, it's interesting that some of the greatest minds that have not been believers, uh, that have not been Christian, I'm thinking of, of uh, in, what's that? I'm sorry. Go ahead. C.S. Lewis. Well, uh, C.S. Lewis? Well, was a skeptic, yeah, but then he, he came around. Great minds, many of them later are converted, but great minds frequently will take this, this approach of, I, you know, I don't, I'm afraid not. I'm afraid there's not anything out there. You, you get the Rousseau's and you get the, you know, others who express skepticism. Sometimes that skepticism takes on an angry edge, eventually, out of frustration. But the idea is they're saying, I'm afraid not, and it makes me sad that I'm afraid not with regard to any, any great beliefs. Pessimism is almost more a mood than it is an intellectual approach that really affects people. Um, and yet, there are people in the world who are basically pessimistic and saying, I'm afraid not. I'm afraid there's not any meaning in the world or any God in the heavens or anything that you can look to. And then the fourth one, which is close to what I call lazyism, is secularism. Secularism says, I don't care. It basically says, I have a lot of other things to occupy my attention, so therefore I don't care. These are the materialists, the sensualists, the people who are focused on the things of this life and this world and the pleasure they can attain, rather than on spiritual things. Now this is the one, the secularist, the materialist, is the one that's become most dominant in our society. People occupy themselves with getting, getting more toys instead of the serious things of, of the spirit. Um, now, Agnosticism, I don't know. Skepticism, I don't think so. Pessimism, I'm afraid not. Secularism, I don't care. This is, these are so dominant in our culture, we have the responsibility for being able to address these things from a Christian perspective, to provide knowledge, to provide um, assurance, to provide encouragement, to provide alternatives. Theology, the study of Christian theology, will give us those things. But you've got to work at it. You know, you don't go to sleep tonight not understanding how to respond to those who don't know, don't think so, are afraid, or don't care. You don't go to sleep tonight not knowing and wake up tomorrow morning knowing. You have to put some work into it, and that's part of our job. Pardon? Well, they get those positions because they see the good and evil in the world and don't understand what 
doesn't make sense. Right, they don't have answers, yeah. And, and it's our job to help provide them based upon our study of what God has revealed, okay? So one of the primary tasks of Christian theology is to prepare us to respond to these ways of thinking and believing. Out of compassion, not out of, out of competition, but rather because our job is to try to help, to show them there is hope, there are answers, there is reason for encouragement in a God who loved them enough to come himself in the person of Jesus, okay? <clears throat> Any questions about that? This is all the sort of why. Why do we do this? For our own personal benefit in growing closer to God, but also so we can minister to other people for, who have questions. The best heart in the world, the most pious person who's never thought about this stuff is not going to be able to answer the questions of people who are agnostic or skeptic or pessimistic or uh, secularist. Okay. So, let's talk about theology as the queen of the sciences. This may not be an expression you're familiar with, but historically, theology was called the queen of sciences. It was the overarching standard that could and should tie together all of the points of human advancement. I'm going to talk about that a little bit historically. Back in the high Middle Ages, that is the 11th, 12th, and 13th centuries, when the coming out of the Dark Ages and all of that, that was when the education really began to blossom. There were universities in Europe. People were really concerned about learning again. The Dark Ages was when pretty much the lights went out in Europe, you know, between 400 and you know, 900, whenever you want to count, to the, the end of the Dark Ages. People don't like calling the Dark Ages linear because they think that sounds judgmental, that it sounds negative. Well, I'm sorry, there's a lot to be negative about the Dark Ages, and so I call them the Dark Ages. Literally, education went away um, in Europe during that time. And had it not been for the Byzantine Empire in, uh, in the East and the Irish monks in the West, the rest of Europe was lost for <laughs> hundreds of years. Okay. Um, I won't get into that. You can get me started on this stuff. <laughs> well, during the High Middle Ages, that is about AD 1000 to 1300, when education really developed and prospered and bloomed, there were seven liberal arts. This is where our concept of a liberal arts education comes from. The seven liberal arts were grammar, logic, rhetoric, arithmetic, geometry, music, and astronomy. Some of those we still study. Um, but the sense was that all of those seven individual liberal arts needed something to tie them together. In fact, what they needed was some overarching standard that they could all refer back to that would be sort of the foundation for them. And in that day, scholars, I believe, rightly saw that that standard should be the Bible. That standard should be our consistent belief in God. And scholars saw that a person's view of God and a person's uh, knowledge of and belief in the Bible affected every other one of those aspects of life. And that all of them, both connected together and could be directed and uh, made more positive in a person's life, this is where the concept of a worldview comes from. How all of those different things fit together to create a worldview. How a person felt about God and about what God revealed himself in the Bible is what created their worldview as the foundation for everything else. So for that reason, in the High Middle Ages, it was said that theology was the natural standard against which all other scholarship, all other endeavors of life referred back to and were measured by, and therefore it was called the Queen of Sciences, the overarching standard. Now, needless to say, we don't hold to that so much anymore. In fact, in most situations, I'll quote I'm Howard Marshall again. By the way, I have a couple of books up here. Um, which are not for sale. <laughs> I've already had somebody trying to buy them here. <laughs> um, two of the best theologians, and these, are, these men are both referred to in the book that you've got, in chapter 10 and other places. I. Howard Marshall's New Testament Theology. When you get into New Testament Theology, it's not really light reading, as you can see. And then George Eldon Ladd's uh, Theology of the New Testament. This was written first in 1974. Uh, George Eldon Ladd was the professor of New Testament theology and exegesis at Fuller Seminary, where I did my degree. In fact, he died in 82 while I was there. I never had him as a professor, but he sort of he created the New Testament Studies Department. And this book 
is revised and updated by Donald Hagner, who was my New Testament professor and who worked under uh, Ladd when he was there. And so it's kind of fun for me. I had some seminar classes where I worked closely with Don Hagner. And he's the one that, that redid this whole book. So these are both really excellent books if you want to go further in this. And they are referred to often in this Encountering the New Testament book. But Marshall, with regard to the fact that Theology used to be the queen of sciences and was seen as, as foundational to all other scholarship and all other learning and even all of life endeavor. Uh, Howard Marshall said this, Within universities and colleges, he means today, Christian theology is often regarded as an unscientific subject using its own highly subjective methods and producing results which can have no possible claim to scientific validity. It has become fashionable to turn away from theology to religious studies. The comparative examination and description of the various religions of mankind, including Christianity, is one of them, from an allegedly impartial and scientific point of view. So the very idea that theology could have one time been thought of as a science, most people today, most academics today, would find that absurd. And yet, the... First definition of science in Webster's dictionary is a distinct, systematized field of study. Got it up here, um, and an object, uh, a field of knowledge, and an object of study. With that regard, theology is a science. <coughs> it is a systematized field of knowledge and an object of study. Now, it, the idea of uh, theology as a science. The reason I'm pushing that, and the reason I think others have pushed it in recent years, is by, by rejecting the sort of objective pursuit of theological knowledge, to uh, objective meaning to, to think that you can actually get into it and there are things for you to learn that's not just your own thinking, not just your own ideas, but there is something there, a field of knowledge and an object of study. By missing that, we've, we've lost this idea of theology as being the, the, the overarching standard that ties so many things together in our life, and as a result, most people today no longer have a worldview that they can articulate. They no longer have a sense what all these different pieces of things in their lives, how they fit together. A worldview is simply an ability to be able to say, this is who I am, this is how I see the world, and this is how I see my place in it. Right? People have lost that because we don't we don't teach it anymore, parents don't encourage it anymore, we no longer even have basic moral values. You know, unless people just sort of get it impressed on them, because if I steal stuff, I'm going to get thrown in jail. Without a sense in which there are reasons to do things and reasons not to do things. Okay? I've got to preach it. Let me get back. Um, but while I believe that there is validity in seeing uh, theology as a science, a particular field of study, we also need to recognize there are differences. That, um, for instance, science, by this I mean physical sciences, Science and philosophy seek the I-it truth that leads to knowledge by use of reason and senses. In other words, science, say natural science, they look at the things in the world, the, the animals, the plants, the geology, whatever, and they figure out, they relate to it, I-it, in a way to be able to understand it and articulate it to gain knowledge about it, right? And to do that, they use the senses of observation, you know, our five senses, and they use their rationality, their reason. Now, theology, on the other hand, seeks a different kind of truth. <coughs> theology seeks an I-thou truth. Because the object of our study is a personality that is God. And that's not a truth that leads just to knowledge, although that's part of it, but rather it leads to faith. So, Theology is based upon revelation, remember? You're going to hear that a lot. God revealing himself to us and on our reason and senses. God gave us our rationality, our ability to reason for a purpose. He gave us our ability to observe with our senses for a purpose. You don't throw those away when it comes to doing theology or anything else with God. God, those are still valuable and useful. And in fact... If you want to have any kind of impact on those other isms we talked about or anything else in the world, you better learn to use your brains and you better pay attention. Use your senses of observation. Carolyn's grinning over there because <laughs> she's heard me say 10,000 times the greatest failing of humanity is not paying attention, not using the gifts God gave us. Okay? So, 
I believe that theology, if it's to have the needed impact in the world, it must affirm reason and sense observation just as philosophy and science do. Now, I want to talk about that for a minute. Theology must observe, must affirm the use of our rationality, our reason, and sense observation. It has to pay attention because God gave us those things, and because without using those, that's why Christians are thought of as being stupid. And you know what? A lot of Christians are. Not because they don't have the IQ, but because they don't, don't think they have to try. We need to work harder at this understanding and being able to relate the things that God has revealed to us. First to learn them, and then to relate them to the world in a moving way with everything that's going on. I, I love it when somebody says, oh, you know, I, I'm okay with that Christianity, but um, I don't, most of those Christians, they just need a crutch. Really? Do I strike you as somebody who needs a crutch? And we should all be people who use our brains and use our reason and use our ability to observe. We should be, and this used to be the truth, this used to be the case, Christians were the greatest of the artists and of the thinkers because they understood that God gave us these things for a reason and we needed to use them, and we have lost that. Now, the truth of theology is given by revelation of God rather than only being discovered by our independent reason and senses because Christian theology starts not with me going out and seeing what's in the world. Christian theology starts with a confession. Christian theology starts from the point of view where I say Jesus is Lord. And then with that start, that re revealed knowledge, I take what that means, and then I take it out to the world and say, okay, what does that mean in terms of me living my life in this world and relating to other people and communicating the truth that God has shared with me? We cannot prove the aspects of our faith using science or philosophy. That's, that's the difference. You cannot prove the virgin birth by empirical verification. You cannot reason to a full understanding of the Trinity. It is a mystery. And one of the mistakes people make is they're not willing to say, well, yeah, that's a mystery. If you've heard me preach, you've heard me say a number of times, this is one of the mysteries of the faith. Because at a certain point, our minds and our ability to articulate break down. They're not sufficient to the great mysteries of the faith. The Incarnation is a mystery. The Trinity is a mystery. Um, and yet, it doesn't mean that they contradict our reason, they transcend it instead. And that's an important point in theology. We will come across things that transcend our ability to reason or observe, but not contradict it. You get the difference there? Um, C.S. Lewis, one of my great heroes in the faith, was called the master of the paradox. He would say things that would sort of twist people in the, in the knot. He, he, he had these one-liners, aphorisms. He would say things like, for instance, Christianity has not been found, uh, I'm sorry, Christianity has not been found wrong. Tried and found one. Tried and found one. I got my own quote. Carolyn's heard it many, many times too. <laughs> Christianity has not been tried and found wanting. It has been found difficult and not tried. Wasn't that Chesterton? I did say Chesterton. Oh, I thought you said Lewis. No, did I say Lewis? It's Chesterton. Chesterton. One of my other great heroes in faith. <laughs> uh, for me to misquote Chesterton, you know, uh, I've got friends who would set me on fire for doing that. <laughs> I just missed a bit of a quote. Our reason is transcendent, not? Uh, not a contradiction. I mean, we, we realize that there are certain things that we learn in our theology that we accept by faith. But faith doesn't mean it contradicts reason, it transcends reason. It is bigger than the reason can contain. And again, the, the paradoxes that Chesterton used and others, he would, um, paradox, Jesus was fully God and he was fully man. Not 60-40, not 80-20, he was 100-100. Now we can't understand how that is. And yet it is not a contradiction it is a paradox because it transcends our ability to really understand or explain it, and yet we believe it's fundamentally true. Theologically, I could go on to that and explain to you why he had to be fully God in order to fully forgive our sins, and he had to be fully human in order to be able to take all of our sins on himself on the cross. If he was less of either one, it wouldn't have worked. That's part of our theology, and that transcends our ability sometimes to reason. So, we need to see that theology 
is fundamental to having a worldview that works for us and for the people who have questions in the world, who are lost. And we have to be able to articulate that. Now, again, the truths of theology require faith, but they also require reasoning, rationality, they require perception, and they often require that we make decisions, choices, about what we believe is true. Most of the great um, theological doctrines of the faith at some time or another have had to be articulated because of challenges to them. Theology sets out the content of the Christian faith in very specific ways, unlike comparative religions or whatever, which just say, well, here's sort of an objective kind of thing. Christian theology is not objective at a certain point. As we study it, we ultimately must come to some place where we say, this is what it means to be a Christian. This belief is basic to the Christian faith. Things contrary to that are not consistent with the Christian faith. And again, theology down through the many years has gone through processes where these things have been challenged and the articulation of the theologies have been in response to that. I'll give you a couple examples. Our doctrine of the Trinity, God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three persons in one God, had to be articulated in the late 3rd and 4th century because a man named Arius started preaching and teaching that Jesus was not co-eternal with God the Father. Arius' famous heretical statement was, there was a time when he, Jesus, was not. Well, when Arius started teaching that, Athanasius, one of the great teachers and saints of the church, stepped up and said, you're wrong. And he countered it with other arguments from Scripture. This led to the first great council of the church, the Council of Nicaea, and the creed that we use the third week of every month here in our church, the Nicene Creed. That is a theological statement that came out of the conflict where somebody had to say, no, that's not what, Christ, what the Bible says. That's not what we believe as part of Christian theology. This is. Likewise, the battle between St. Augustine and Pelagius in the 4th and 5th centuries gave us our understanding of original sin, of grace and atonement. The Protestant Re Reformation, the Protestant Reformers opposed the Catholic doctrines in the 15th and 16th century that led to our current theologies of salvation and of the sacraments. Uh, John Calvin, who is the founder of the Reformed uh, theology that Presbyterianism is based on, Presbyterianism, that means the church that we attend with over there. Um, John Calvin opposed Jacob Arminius in the 16th and 17th century, and that opposition brought us the articulation of our reformed doctrine of election, and so on and on. These great truths that resided in the New Testament, God had certain people unwrap the depths of those theological truths at different times when the church especially needed them. But somebody had to work at this. Somebody had to pay attention. Somebody had to think about it. We have the advantage of 2,000 years of God inspiring not only the writers of the New Testament, but those that he brought along to interpret it. And yes, there have been some wrong interpreters, which is why we have to work at this, to make sure we get it right. And that we are, we are studying, we are thinking, we are working through all of this. Um, any questions about any of that? The sort of why theology. I hope I didn't lose you there. I hope it wasn't over your head. Uh, fortunately, that person isn't here today. So. <laughs> yes. Did you put the quote that you gave us a few minutes ago? Not C.S. Lewis, but on the website. Uh, the Chesterton quote, yes. uh, the one about Tried Christianity has not been tried and found wanting; it's right. been found difficult and not tried. I will do that. Um, let me remember that here. Since Write it down. Help me remember who it was. <laughs> <laughs> Carolyn, rough estimate. How many times have I quoted that and said just <laughs> Me too, though. <laughs> yeah, a thousand times. So, um, okay. Uh, I used to be on the board of the American Chesterton Society. Um, so, I, I quote him a lot. Questions, Michael? I heard you mention Ar Arminius. Yes. And I've heard a lot of references to Arminian theology. theology. Is that heretical theology? Depends on whether you're a Presbyterian or a Methodist. <laughs> um, the question of, it's a question of free will. And to my, to my short version of it is, Calvin had it right. The people who came after Calvin, Council of Dort, which is when they got together and, you know, after Calvin's death, and they, they really tried to nail down Calvin, the, Calvinist theology, they pushed it way too far. 
If you go back and you read Calvin himself in the Institutes, for instance, I had the great pleasure of studying Calvin's Institutes in a small seminar with J.I. Packer at Covenant uh, at uh, Regent College. Yeah. If you actually read Calvin, he was pretty, pretty humble about this. But he looks at the passages in Romans and elsewhere that says, before the creation of the world, God chose us. He elected those who would be saved. It does say that, and it says it unequivocally in more than one place. Calvin said, we have to take that seriously. And so he developed a doctrine of election, but he also had humility in there. And he said, don't ever, ever, ever try to use that to judge somebody else, because that's not your job. Your job is to say, has God saved you? Okay, if some, and then the Second Helvetic Confession says that if someone believes in Jesus Christ and believes they are saved, then they are elect. Now Arminius, he was saying it's entirely a matter of free will, and in the process he questioned the idea of whether, you know, whether we, original sin came into it some for him. He said whether you're saved or not is just entirely your choice. You decide, or am I going to accept this or am I not? And then God receives that decision. Well, there are parts of Scripture that has trouble with that. So to me, the Calvinists, not John Calvin, but the Calvinists push too far toward, you don't really have a say in the issue, God either saves you or he doesn't, and you're pre-elected. And then Arminius went too far in saying, it's entirely your decision, and God isn't in there. If I'm going to err, I'll err on the side of the sovereignty of God, that God knows what he's doing, and he's in charge, and he's running things, okay? But the, the doctrine of election was... Um, you know, Arminius goes too far, far too far, I believe, in the issue of claiming against free will, and in fact, it's, you know, my, it's up to me. I'm the one that saves me by making the decision. Okay. It's fascinatingly confusing because um, <laughs> Good way to put the Southern Baptist uh, background that I'm familiar with spends a lot of time going out and evangelizing and saying, come on, you just got to pray this mm -hmm. prayer. You just got to pray this prayer. And we're told to evangelize. Right, but that approach, you, you come on, you just got to pray this prayer, you just got to, it is almost like, oh, well, the decision must be up to this person, exactly. whether or not he's yeah. going to pray the prayer or not. I mean, yeah, and that's where humility comes in. And I'm going to talk about humility a little bit. I mean, we, have, we believe that it is all the work of God. I mean, you know, Ephesians, Paul writes, the, by grace you are saved through faith. It is a gift of God, not of works. And the question is, how much of my making my own decisions is works versus just simply accepting what God has already done, um, and how much of it is, is. So, yeah, there's. When I say Calvin and Arminius, I think Calvin was right. Arminius went too far on the free will, but I think the Calvinists were too too hard. They are too harsh. They're too judgmental. Okay, uh, but I am a Reformed theologian, I, which is the, the theology of Calvin, and my wife and I disagree on some of the issues of election, for instance. Okay. <laughs> She'll learn. She'll get. Learn. <laughs> That's why I'm taking the class. That's why I'm taking the class. <laughs> um, let me see where I am here. You have coverage for that so far? <laughs> so, um, but yeah, that, that's the issue there is, I mentioned Calvin and Arminius. Well, the doctrine of election, the reformed doctrine of election, really was refined and articulated out of that conflict. Um, that's, again, depends upon, there are Protestant, denominations that are Arminian more so in their theology than Calvinists. Okay, and there are differences. I'm just saying that Reformed theology, the whole, even Arminius, Arminius articulated his doctrine out of that conflict, as well as, as Calvin having done so. Okay, now, uh, interesting thing, we have a good friend who uh, is Protestant now, and she grew up Catholic. We were at a retreat, I think it was, and um, the teaching, we're talking about Martin Luther, and Luther's, you know, some of Luther's teaching, etc. And she was just, it was like she was grinning. And afterwards, we said, what's so funny? And she said, I grew up thinking Luther was a bad guy. <laughs> you know? And you guys talk about him how he was great. <laughs> and so, yeah, it sometimes depends on, on which side of it you're on. Uh, but the, my point, the point I was making is that our theology, the articulation of our theology, I believe there are times in history when the work that is done to, to deal with challenges to the Christian faith, and Calvin and Arminius is not the best idea because there's still some questions there. Um, the, they happen in the, the, uh, the fires of conflict and the fires of heresy. There's no question that Arius was wrong. Okay, for instance, the thing that led to the first great council of the church. He said that Jesus was just a guy who came along and then God anointed him as being 
his son, but that Jesus was born and before that he hadn't existed. Well, that's fundamentally contrary to John 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning, and all things were made through him. Nothing was made, you know, that was not made through him, and the, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. So, um, it's through the fires of those, if you will, heresies that come up, and through conflicts, that those theologies frequently, historically, have been articulated. But these points of differentiation between Arminius and Calvin are not so fundamentally contradicted in the... Uh, I mean, there's not a fundamental... I can argue both sides of that from Scripture. Uh, that's one of the things that... I, I often have said that um, we have to have humility about some of this, and we have to decide where we land, and I'm a Calvinist theology, theologian, I think Calvin is right, but when, I, when we get to heaven, there's going to be a whole lot of forehead slapping. How did I miss that? How did I get that wrong? Why didn't I see that? Okay, And so we have to have some humility about it, and that's one of the areas that we do. Now, I have no problem saying Arius had it wrong. Okay. Uh, Marvin? Oh, it extends to evangelism when they say, well, their blood will be required on your head if you have yeah. preached them and are the heathen lost. Yeah. You know, what do you do about that? So yeah. it, it really becomes a big, big issue. Right. Well, and again, I, I can quote the passages that, that Calvin was moved by, and then he said, they're here. What, you know, what do you want me to do with these? Because they're very clear about election. And yet it says, you know, that if they're going to believe, somebody has to preach to them. You know, how can they believe if they don't hear, and how can they hear if you don't go? Okay, and this, as Marvin said, that uh, we have responsibility. Their blood is on our head if they if we don't make the effort to make them hear the good news. Well, again, I can. That sounds like looks like I can work up a group. To oh yeah. <laughs> okay. Where does where does predestination? Well, that's the election issue. That's, yeah, that's the that. election issue. But but the definition of predestination in your opinion. Well, predestination is, is, is election. That's the, that's the same thing. And it basically says that prior to the creation of the world, God, God decided, he elected, he preordained is one of the other words he used, who it is who is going to come to faith in Jesus Christ. And it does say that. How do we balance that with God does not desire that any would be in a loss but that all would come to a saving knowledge and some other verses? Well, we deal with it humbly. Okay? And we do our best to share the good news and know that God's in charge over all of it anyway. And now we're going to take a break. Not because I'm running from that question, but we can, we can go on and on for a long time. About what theology is, uh, particularly why it's important to us, and then we're going to unwrap those things as we get into more detail uh, throughout the entire course. But I want to give you now kind of a brief history of New Testament theology as, again, introduction. And in this part of what we're going to talk about here are some of the ways in which New Testament theology has gone off track because... Where we are currently in the start, early in the 21st century, where theology as a whole is pretty much still off track from the last couple hundred years. And you need to be aware of that in order to be able to understand some of what you may read or hear or uh, as you move along. You need to have a perspective on what the current status is of theology, the New Testament theology, and other kinds of theology uh, in the current age. So let's talk about a brief history. First, Prior to the Reformation, which started in 1517, the Reformation is in the 16th century, and you know what the Reformation is. It is when, when first Martin Luther challenged the premises that the Catholic Church was working under by, by asking 95 questions, or the 95 theses of Martin Luther. And when he, he was a monk at the time, he nailed them on the door of the Wittenberg Cathedral, and he started a revolution of new thinking, of new theology, of revising the way the Catholic Church had been acting. Prior to that, there was only the Catholic Church in Europe. There was the Orthodox Church already existed in the East. But, um, and then Luther wasn't actually the first person to be a reformer. Before that, even, in Switzerland, um, they had already begun to move in the direction that would be Protestantism in Switzerland, and so some of the earliest reformers were there. But Luther's the one that really kicked it off in terms of it being a continent-wide thing. Now, prior to the Reformation, dogmatic theology was almost all that existed. You will remember dogmatic theology is theology that is done for the purpose of either articulating or defending the doctrines and theology of a particular church. So prior to the Reformation, all of the theology that was being done was in order to try to prove that the Catholic Church was right. It was all done, there was no such thing as a lay theologian. It was all done by 
the clergy or the magisterium it's called, that is the people in authority in the Catholic Church. Com scripture was not available to most people. What scripture was available was in, I, Latin was the most common, the Latin Vulgate was the common use in that time. Most people didn't speak Latin, so the average person couldn't open scripture, study it, come to their own understanding. All of theology was dogmatic theology where the Catholic Church was reading the Latin, interpreting it, telling people what it meant as a way of defending what the Catholic Church believed. Okay? And I'm not saying that necessarily as a, hor as a horrible thing. That's a statement of fact. That is what the historic circumstance was. Now, when the Reformation came along, one of the major premises of the Reformation was the sola scriptura. There were three great cries in the Reformation. One of them was sola gratia, or, or grace alone. One of them was sola fide, or faith alone. Grace and faith. Remember I quoted Ephesians 2 just a minute ago. That by grace you're saved through faith. Not because the church says you're saved. Not because the church administers grace. But because God, by your faith and His grace, saves you. So sola fide... Faith alone, sola gratia, grace alone, and sola scriptura, scripture alone. It was and still is today the doctrine of the Catholic Church, and I'm not picking on Catholics. Okay, I have some, some of my very wonderful close friends who love Jesus are Catholic. But again, we have to look historically at the reality. The Catholic Church, from a doctrinal point of view, then and even now, says there are two sources of authority. There is the authority that is Scripture, and there is the authority of the Church, that believing that God has spoken through the Church and the authority of the Church, and that those two things are balanced against each other. Well, in those days, they said the authority of the Church interprets Scripture and tells you what it means and how you should understand it. Sola Scriptura in the Reformation meant, no, the Church is made up of people, and people get it wrong. It is... Scripture is the ultimate authority. Scripture alone, sola scriptura. So there was a huge emphasis at that time on studying the Bible, of having it in translations people could read. You know, one of the most important things Luther did, besides actually starting the Reformation, was he translated the Bible into German. There was a period of time when he was on the run, when he'd been excommunicated and he was to be killed, uh, where he was hidden in the uh, Hohenberg Castle, and he spent that time writing, translating from the original languages, the German or the, the scripture into German. He did two things when he did that. He not only gave the Bible to the German people in a language they could understand, but he invented modern German. You know, he in his translating, he created German that was to be the standard type of German that was to be used from then on. So, you know, he was a he made he had a huge advantage linguistically as well as uh, biblically. So that <clears throat> emphasis on Scripture alone meant that Scripture was seen as the only uh, authoritative rule for our faith as opposed to the dictates of the church, and that there was therefore an inherent need for all Christians to study it, to pay attention to what it said, especially the New Testament, the part that tells us about Jesus. Now, because of that Reformation emphasis, then in the, um, the 16th century and into the 17th century, we developed the Protestant scholastics. They took all of the initial work toward scripture and theology that the, the reformers had done, and they developed it into systematic theologies. They got in, you know, these guys are doing the study, they didn't have the freedom to develop theology and articulate them on their own, not just wait for the church to do it. And so theology started to be being done on a lay level or, or lay, uh, by lay people and in different different levels within the, the body of believers. Now there was a period in the 17th and 18th century then that, um, well, I, I should say in, this, in the 17th century, there was a brief period of time in the high scholasticism where they sort of went, went back, uh, backwards some, and started focusing again on, on very formal interpretations as being only dogmatic. In other words, emphasizing just what does it mean that you can you should believe based upon this rather than studying it to learn what God wants us to know about it? But then we get into the 17th and 18th century, and we have the period of the Enlightenment that happened in Europe. It was the rise of rationalism. Rationalism is the belief that the ultimate uh, determination of truth is by my mind, that my rationality, not supernatural, anything else, but my mind is the thing that decides what is real and true in the world. And inherent in that was a denial of anything supernatural. 
Yes. All right. Um, going back to the Luther thing, how long had this might be a crazy question, but how long had the Catholic Church been around before he did all that? Well, the Catholic like, Church, you know, that's probably a really difficult question. Pretty much 1517 years, <laughs> oh, okay. um, because depending on where you want to draw the line, but the Catholic Church would say that they were built on the foundation, the rock of Peter, the Apostle Peter. Mm -hmm. Now, in terms of organized as a church. It happened so slowly and over such a wide area that there's no one place where you can say, ding, this is where the Catholic Church starts. The Catholic Church would say that it started with Peter as Bishop of Rome. When did it split from the Orthodox? Uh, 1100. So, um, you know, there was about the, the Catholic, the Orthodox Church and the Catholic Church. Orthodox was the Greek Church. They spoke Greek. They had different rites, very different orientation. The Latin Church in the West ended up splitting in the uh, 11th century, and they centered, the <coughs> Eastern Orthodox Church was centered in uh, Istanbul, as we know it today, it was Constantinople then, and the uh, Western Church in Rome, all right? But the Catholic Church was the one that Martin Luther was dealing with, and they had existed. There's no one date where you can say, this is when the church started. Right. They would say it went all the way back to Apostle Peter, which means right up to the time of Jesus, okay? All right? Um, and then through that whole period of time, they were developing the doctrine and the structure of the hierarchy and all of that at various levels. Now, so in the Enlightenment, there started to be, through the growth of rationalism, a denial of the supernatural. Miracles couldn't really happen. Jesus wasn't really divine. He couldn't really have risen from the dead. The idea being, that's hard for me to understand. And if I can't understand it, it can't be true. That's what rationalism is. If I can't understand it completely, Beyond any question or shadow of a doubt, then it can't be true. There was no humility in that. Okay. And yet that was what rationalism was about. Um, anything miraculous, anything supernatural in scripture or anywhere else had to be rejected, had to be cast out. And so um, at that point, because they had the Bible, and the Bible was the foundational document of, all, of Western civilization, they had to decide, well, what are we going to do with this now if we don't believe it's miraculous? The move then was to begin to study the Bible from a purely historical point of view. And you get that, that point is when you really start the historical critical method, it's called. Which means this Bible was written by Jewish people at that point, you know, 1800 years ago. And so we need to study it like we would study any ancient document so that we can learn about the history that led up to it and what the, what the Jewish people were like and what this early church that wrote it. We'll study it as history but not as anything supernatural or miraculous or divinely inspired. Okay. <laughs> that was, they couldn't just throw it away. Again, some of them tried. Uh, Voltaire swore that, that the Bible would be gone within 100 years, and in less than 100 years, his old shop was a Bible store, <laughs> okay. which tells you something. Um, and yet, they said, well, okay, it's here. It is part of our culture. We have to do something with it. So they decided to study it like they would study any other ancient document. That was the rise of the historical emphasis on the Bible without the sense in which it was God's Word. Now, in terms of the study of theology, um, in 1787, and some of you who were in the Old Testament theology class would have heard this, 1787, a man named Johann Philip Gobbler was um, hired to be a professor of theology at Aldorf University in Germany. So much of this comes back to Germany, right, Bob? Um, you know, the, the, the Germany was the center of so much theology. Remember, Martin Luther was German. Okay. Um, well, Gobbler, in his in his uh, introductory address, the first address he gave the school, he recommended something pretty radical. Prior to this time, there was only really one kind of theology. It had been dogmatic theology up until the Reformation, which means all theology was just to try to, you know, for the church to tell people, here's what you should believe. Then, with the Reformation and the emphasis more on lay study of Scripture, there was, uh, there was a study of theology, but it was still a sense in which there was a dogmatic aspect and there was a systematic uh, theology part. Gobbler comes along, and in his opening address, he suggests that we needed to split theology up into biblical theology and systematic theology. Systematic theology and dogmatic theology had been pretty much the same thing up until then, and which meant People who wanted to just do good, solid theology without having somebody tell them, yes, but has the church approved of this yet? You know, are you doing this in order to, you know, teach it to people and make sure they understand that they're acting right? 
Um, Gobbler said we need to separate these two, do biblical theology in terms of the historical, remember I just told you there was a growth in the sense of historical approach, um, what scriptures meant when they were written, what they meant to the Jews and the early Christian church. Then systematic theology needs to be more doctrinal rather than historic. It needs to talk about how does systematic, how does theology apply to our lives now? So biblical theology is what, what had it meant in the past, and systematic theology, what does it mean now? By doing that, it meant biblical theology could move forward without the sense in which it always had, always had the church having to tell them, it's okay for you to say that. It's okay for you to, you know, to study that. They, could, they sort of said, okay, let's systematic theology continue to be the, the doctrinal, here's how we're going to teach you kind of thing, but let's go back and study biblical theology as separate from that. Um, and while Gabler himself was a rationalist and not a particularly pious man, I don't think, this actually was helpful because it allowed the academic pursuit of theology to move forward without the burden of the church controlling it quite as much as it had, even after the Reformation sometimes. Okay? Questions about that? Again, those of you who are in Old Testament theology already got some of this because when Gabler did this, it affected all of the Bible, Old and New Testament. Um, then we get into systematic theology continuing pretty much as it always had before, uh, but uh, no longer entirely dogmatic in the focus, but biblical theology started at this point pushing to discover more and more what was behind and before the scriptures that we have. Meaning, who were these writers? Where did they come from? Who were they writing to? What was their motivation? All of that kind of stuff. And they developed what was called um, a a biblical critical method. The development of biblical criticism, the definition is the scholarly study and investigation of biblical writings that seeks to make discerning judgments about those writings. Now, I'm about to tell you why it is that the very idea of biblical criticism has become so unpopular amongst evangelicals and fundamentalists. In fact, for many people, it has come to be synonymous with lack of belief, lack of faith. In fact, biblical criticism is very important, and if it's done right, it's really needed. We need someone who is studying this stuff in order to make sure that we're getting it right. Unfortunately, and I'm going to talk about that, too many of the people who started biblical criticism uh, back in the late 18th and early 19th centuries through the whole 19th and 20th centuries really took us in the wrong direction for various reasons. But a higher criticism, or biblical, crit I'm sorry, biblical criticism, is an effort to make sure we're getting it right and using all the resources we can, archaeological resources and uh, ancient document resources, everything we can <coughs> to make sure that we have an accurate view of Scripture, what it says and what it means. All right? And it's important. <coughs> there are two aspects to this biblical criticism. The first one is called lower criticism. This concerns the study of the texts of Scripture themselves. What they say, what we can learn from the various manuscripts, the versions and codices, to ensure that we have the best and most accurate Bible possible. This, for instance, was the realm of the scholars who worked with the Dead Sea Scrolls. They took the Dead Sea Scrolls and said, okay, this is now the oldest Old Testament documents we have. How does that inform and make sure that we have the most accurate book of Isaiah that we could? Does it tell us anything new about that? So, lower criticism deals with the actual texts and the versions that we may be aware of. That's why when you read a good Bible, you'll come to a passage and they'll have, a, you know, they'll have an asterisk and a, a footnote. It will say, some of the most ancient manuscripts do not include this verse. Well, they include that in there so that you're fully informed. It keeps us from going in the wrong direction. Nowadays, that's not called lower criticism anymore. I mean, who'd want to be known that they were a lower critic? It's called textual criticism. Looking at the text, how did we get it, is it accurate, what versions are there, etc. It doesn't deal with the, much more detail than that. The second level, which is the one that has caused so much grief for people, is called higher criticism. This is the study of the historic origins, the dates, the authorship of the books of the Bible, basically what was behind and before those biblical texts were written. Um, there are various kinds of, of uh, criticism that are part of higher criticism. Source criticism, textual criticism, form criticism, redaction criticism, rhetorical criticism, canonical criticism, narrative criticism, psychological criticism, feminist theology criticism, and on and on and on. In fact, in your book, chapter 10, which I mentioned, 
is a chapter on the modern approaches to the New Testament. And they look at some of the developments in this, um, this higher critical, especially, but the critical approaches. And they mention a number of different kinds of interpretive theologies, as I mentioned. Textual, source, form, redaction, literary, canonical, sociological, um, discourse analysis, structuralism. You can do feminist theology, black theology. You know, all of those are various ways in which criticism, higher criticism, has been applied. Uh, not only to find the, what's behind it, but also kind of to explain the interpretive approaches. Now, and that's a good chapter. It gives you a good sense of it. I'm trying to sort of complement it by some of the things I say here. So higher criticism has a value. Um, it's valuable and important, but it has, as I said, come to be associated with a lack of faith. And there's a reason for that. Because the people who did higher criticism for so long were not believers. And they used, um, they were skeptics primarily, not all of them, but some of the most uh, vi visual, vivid ones, some of the ones that were most dramatic, were most recognized, to the point that, and there's a great quote here from Ken and Dyson Hay, he has an article online that you, you <coughs> want to write his name down and look it up because it's a great article, about higher criticism and the problems with it. Haig said this, No study requires so devout a spirit and so exalted a faith in the supernatural as the pursuit of higher criticism. It demands the ability of a scholar combined with the simplicity of a believing child of God. But the works of the higher critic has not always been pursued in a reverent spirit, nor in the spirit of scientific and Christian scholarship. So, we have a problem in that the higher critics have tended not to be people of faith. And there were three particular problems with the people involved in higher criticism. The first one is that the leaders of higher criticism, most of whom, again, I'm sorry, Bob, were German. Uh, liberal theology has been primarily sort of the hallmark of German theologians for the last uh, 200 years. The leaders of the higher criticism movement have based their theories largely on their own prior subjective conclusions. They have not gone to scripture says, what does it say, what does it mean? They said, okay, I don't believe in miracles, I don't believe Jesus was divine, I don't believe this is a supernatural book, now let me look at it. And what would that have meant in terms of how they interpreted it? I'll give you two examples. One of them is the documentary hypothesis of the Pentateuch, uh, the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, the, the liberal, historical, critical, higher critics, say that that was written not by Moses, which is traditionally held, but rather was written by as many as ten people, or even multiple schools of people, that it was written hundreds or even a thousand years after Moses, that none of it was divinely inspired. They even go so far, there are places where the doc documentary hypothesis, they have multiple authors, the four primary ones are labeled J, E, P, and D, which they're, that means Yahweh, Eloist, etc., um, and there are some verses. One verse can be broken up into five or six or seven different sources, according to them. It gets downright crazy, right? It, and, and we've reached the point where people started rejecting it simply because they went, I'm sorry, that doesn't make any sense anymore. You know, I, there's, no, there's no rational way it could have gotten there, the way you're describing it. Uh, and I'll, I'll give you a couple of other things about that in a minute. And the second one is the Jesus Seminar. Are you familiar with the Jesus Seminar? I know some of you are because talk, we've talked about it. It's a group of supposed theologians, they have credentials academically, who got together for many, many years and they would gather and they would read a passage from the New Testament of what Jesus was supposed to have said. And then they would vote using little stones on whether they thought that this was something Jesus said Definitely, or it definitely wasn't something Jesus said, or it might have been something Jesus said. They ended up rejecting well over 80% of all of what the New Testament says was, was the words of Jesus. There was a special on TV <laughs> a number of years ago, and Carolyn and I laugh about this because she was there when I was watching this, and they had, they, it was um, well, Peter Jennings was doing the interviewing. He had theologians from the Jesus Seminar. And I remember they're saying all these absurd things, and I'm getting hotter and hotter and hotter. <laughs> Finally, one of them says, well, the Gospels say this, but I prefer to believe. And he started off on some flight of fancy that out of his own head, and please excuse my language, but I'm being honest about what I said then. I said, who the hell cares what you think? <laughs> Where is this coming from? You have no basis. 
basis for that. You have no, there's nothing in scripture that would give you even an inkling that that was the case. You have no other documents to take you there. You're supposed to be a scholar of the Bible and you're teaching this stuff? It's something you made up because you would prefer if that's what it said. That's not a good enough reason. This was a man, for all of his academic credentials, who came from a point of view, he was more concerned about what he wanted the Bible to say than what it did say, with no support at all. Okay? That was true of all the scholars of the Jesus Center. Okay? Um, <coughs> if it's written in red, it's got to be <laughs> Well, may the Lord forgive them for that. Okay? So, that's the, that's the first problem, is... They, they based it on their own subjective theories and conclusions, not what Scripture actually said, or any other source said. And they couldn't even say, well, based on what Josephus said from that same time period, blah, blah. No, just they made it up. The second thing is the leaders of this movement, sorry, Bob, mostly German. <laughs> he, Bob, the first time I talked about German theologians causing these problems, he said, why are you picking on the Germans? <laughs> Plenty, right? Um, that these leaders, mostly German, have been preoccupied with the theories, so preoccupied with theories, that they seem to lack common sense at a certain point. They, they build these layers and layers and layers and layers of stuff that they just can, you know, made up, these conjectures. And a couple of quotes here, from again from Canon Dyson Hay, who said, their conclusions seem to the average mind to be curiously warped. <laughs> and it's true, you read this stuff, you go, what? And Matthew Arnold, no relation, <laughs> He said, if you shut a number of men up to make study and learning the business of their lives, how many of them, from want of some discipline or another, seem to lose all balance of judgment, all common sense? He could have been talking about the Jesus Seminar, as far as I can tell. Okay. So, those two things. They First, they based it on their own subjective conclusions before they went to Scripture. Secondly, they, their theories, at a certain point, they couldn't even recognize it didn't make sense anymore. And thirdly... The dominant men of a higher criticism, and they, you know, for the most part were men. There's some women doing this now, but women tend to be more sensible about stuff and see when something looks ludicrous, okay? Confession, as a man. Um, and the dominant men had a very strong bias against anything supernatural. The presumption they had was that miracles are not possible, so miraculous narrative is suspect. When they talk about Jesus walking on water, well, he, he can't walk on water. He couldn't have done that. Right? There's no sense that the miraculous is possible. Secondly, any predictive prophecy is not possible, so any such statements are invalid. Uh, anything that says what's going to happen in the future, that's silly. We know that can't happen. Where is God in this? Okay. And third... The Bible, to these critics, is not and could not be divinely inspired or revealed. It is an entirely human document with human origins and problems. These were the problems of these guys, and they became the dominant theology for the 19th and early 20th centuries. All right? Now, another quote from Canon Dyson Hay. In one word, the formative forces of higher criticism movement were men who had discarded belief in God and Jesus Christ whom he had sent. The Bible, in their view, was a mere human product. Never study it like it was just any other ancient document. It was a stage in the literary evolution of a religious people. It certainly was not given by the inspiration of God, and it is not the word of the living God. This was the, the presumption that these... Most recent higher critic scholars brought to it. Peanuts, I hear you're writing a book of theology. I hope you have a good title. And um, Snoopy says, I have the perfect title. Has it ever occurred to you, you might be wrong? <laughs> we need to send this to all the members of the Jesus <laughs> Because part of the issue here is that we have to come to this with some humility. Not with the presumption that I'm the smartest guy that's ever come along and I'm going to be the one to figure this out. And that has nothing to do with God. Right? Now remember, I'm a person who says we need to think, we need to pay attention, we need to work hard, we need to study, we need to make sure we are doing the best we can with all of the resources and training and education available. I am not saying just sort of throw up your hands and say, well, whatever it is. No, we have to work at this. That's what theology is. 
But we have to work at it with the assumption that God is in this process. All right? Okay, um, I want to quote, give you a quote now from George Eldon Ladd, this book. Okay. George Eldon Ladd said, Biblical theology is neither the story of humanity's search for God, nor is it a description of a history of religious experience. <laughs> Biblical theology is theology. Remember what theology means. The study of God. It is primarily a story about God and his concern for human beings. Biblical theology, therefore, is not exclusively or even primarily a system of abstract theological truths. It is basically the description and interpretation of the divine activity within the scene of human history that seeks humanity's redemption. George Eldon Ladd was a great scholar who worked very hard at this. And his sense, and the reason I have these two books, Ladd and I. Howard Marshall, is they are two of the best late 20th century, I think Marshall's still alive, <clears throat> scholars who were both evangelicals, who believed in the truth of God's revelation to us, but also did the hard work. And so theology is important. It's important both for our spiritual growth and so that we can effectively communicate with a world of people who don't know and often don't seem to want to know about God and the fact that he loves them. Your job, that's why God brought you to this class, whether you knew it or not when you came here, your job is to be one of those people who do the work of theology so that you can communicate with people about what God wants them to know. About God, about them, and about how God and them are intended to be together. Okay? Any questions about that? I've got one more thing. Marvin. It seems like to the 17th century, the church didn't have problems with the miracles and the healings and so on and so forth. Right. Probably was also a lot of other books and writings around would also say, yeah, that happened and this happened and so on and so forth. Yeah. So our later mind saying, oh, right. can't, can't be. And it, you're right. And the interesting thing is that most of the world today still doesn't have trouble with the supernatural. Mm -hmm. It's Western Europe and mm -hmm. North America mostly, which are the driving forces in you know the world's cultures. Um, after all, we're the ones who have Coke and McDonald's, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I had. Um, a friend of mine who grew up in Brazil, he was a missionary in Brazil, um, the quick version of it is I came upon a woman on our college campus one time, he was a friend of mine in college, and she was having an epileptic seizure, and uh, she was choking on her hair, and so I tried to help her, and later on I was recounting the story, she ended up being fine, and um, I was recounting the story, and my friend AJ, who was a bright, sharp guy, you know, he's a senior executive in, in Cincinnati now, of a, of a mission there, a rescue mission, a large rescue mission. Um, smart guy, he said, well, do you think it might have been a demon? And I was young in my faith at the time, and I went, oh, come on. Really? Demon? The fact is, he had grown up in a culture that recognizes that there is a spiritual realm and a spiritual world that we do not perceive, and in which most of us today, including most Christians, don't really think about or believe in. He had grown up in a culture where they recognized the fact that there were such things as demons, that there were spiritual beings. In my work with World Vision and World Concern and others, and in being in a lot of different parts of the world now, in Africa and in other places, most of the world that is primitive, that isn't preoccupied with, you know, Lexuses and, you know, whatever, um, the nine kinds of iPods, then they recognize that there is something more than what you can experience with your senses. They don't have a problem when you talk about God, you know, God who is spirit and must be worshipped in spirit and truth, but who chose to come incarnate into a physical body for our sake, but then died, was resurrected, went back into heaven, they went, wow, that's exciting. Not, oh, come on, which is what we do. Um, so much of the world still does accept that. We are the heirs of the rationalist movement of Enlightenment Europe, who question all of that, who question anything that, you know, you can't knock on, or taste, or touch, or see, or smell, when in fact, prior to the Enlightenment, and in many parts of the world still today, they recognize there's most of the really important stuff is not so obvious. Even in uh, the Bible, when Jesus went back to Nazareth, he didn't do very many miracles. They, they, they wouldn't believe. They didn't believe. Yeah. Yeah. And his disciples couldn't do miracles either because they didn't believe enough, they didn't pray enough. They, so yeah. we put ourselves in a case where we don't believe in it. So it couldn't be. Yeah. <laughs> if I don't believe it couldn't exist, right? Yeah. Well, and again, one of our first mission fields, our being 
all of you folks, you new, you new theologians, one of our first mission fields is the church. Because we have to wake the church up to the fact that there is more to it than just, does that work for me? Does that give me what I want? And then to be able to deal with the struggles that are in the world. Because those things, agnostic, you know, uh, skeptic, pessimist, secularists, those are the people sitting in our pews, not just the people who haven't come in yet. And we need to be prepared to help them with that. Okay? Um, so in this class, the approach I'm going to take, when you do theology of this kind, you see different, there's sort of two different approaches to biblical theology, and this is a biblical, <coughs> New Testament is a biblical theology. Um, I. Howard Marshall, for instance, he goes through and looks at, um, he, he develops his New Testament theology by taking the, the books of the New Testament one at a time and working on what theology is expressed in the Synoptic Gospels, in John, in Acts, in Paul's epistles, in fact, each one of Paul's epistles. Part three is the Pauline letters, and this is a book of theology, now it's not a survey, but he deals with the letter to the Galatians, then to the Thessalonians, then to the Corinthians, then to the Romans, Philippians, you know, etc. It takes them in chronological order, not the order they're in the Bible. So, Howard Marshall and some others take the approach that you take a very systematic book by book to examine the theology. Some others, for instance, George Eldon Ladd, and, and neither one of these are right or wrong, it's just different approaches, he takes it from the point of view of, he takes the Synoptic Gospels, but he focuses on the Kingdom and the Messiah, then the Fourth Gospel of John, but he deals primarily with the dualism in the Christian life, then the critical problems of resurrection es eschatology in the Church uh, from Acts, and then he looks at Paul as a whole, not book by book. So the two ways that you can deal with this is either one New Testament book after another, either in the order they're in there or chronological order, means Paul, you start with Galatians, not with Romans, or you deal with it topically in a more systematic theology approach. Okay, We're going to do a little both in here, because in eight weeks, we've got a lot of stuff to cover. Um, and <laughs> when you do it the way Marshall did, especially when you take it one book at a time to develop the theology, this is what you get. <laughs> All right, We have eight weeks, <laughs> so 16 hours. So what we're going to do is... Uh, this is the outline of the class I told you, <clears throat> and uh, introduction we're done today. Next week we're going to look at Christology and Incarnation. We're going to focus on the Gospels then, especially the Synoptic Gospels, but we'll get into John as well. Then the third week when we deal with Trinity, uh, adding the doctrines of Father and Holy Spirit, we will again be drawing from the, the Gospels and from the Epistles. So what this is, is, is we're doing this in, a, in terms of a systematic theology kind of thing, dealing with large doctrinal topics. But I'm sort of following through the New Testament from the Gospels down, which is why if I were going to do this some other way, I probably wouldn't put the, third, the fourth week as eschatology, the church, because usually you deal with eschatology after you deal with the nature of you know, Christian anthropology and soteriology, etc. But I'm doing it that way because as we go through this book and as we go through the Bible, the next thing that comes is the book of Acts, which is the formation of the church. And so we'll do eschatology first. Then Christian anthropology, again focusing on the epistles. Soteriology, again the epistles. And then eschatology, the study of last things. That's why Revelation is at the end of our Bible, because it deals with the end. Uh, and then conclusion and final exam. So we're doing kind of a hybrid where I'm doing a systematic topical kind of theology approach, but I'm linking it to the books, the sections of the Bible as we go through there. Okay? Questions about that? Or about anything else we talked about today?